Today we are going to be talking about sustainability. My name is Ryan McSorley. I'm currently one of the co-founders of Neat, a sustainable home care brand. Our products have no single-use plastic and they're all concentrated. So there's no shipping of single-use plastics so and no plastic waste and no shipping unnecessary water around the world. I often say you know, entrepreneurs can solve the world's biggest problems. You know, and you're, you're leading the charge, Ryan. Thank you, GoDaddy, for sponsoring this podcast. You as a listener get 40% off. The code is down below. Welcome, Ryan, to the podcast. Maybe we could start off by you kindly telling the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Ryan McSorley. Um, I guess my background, well, I'm from Northern Ireland originally, um, and my background is in industrial design. Um, so industrial designer by trade. I'm currently one of the co-founders of Neat. Neat is a sustainable home care brand. We have a range of cleaning products for your home, from bathroom cleaner, glass cleaner, multi-surface cleaners, and a range of amazing fragrances. But more importantly, our products have no single-use plastic and they're all concentrated. So um, there's no shipping of um, single-use plastics so and no plastic waste and no shipping unnecessary water around the world. Um, yeah, you get an aluminium bottle, um, a spray bottle that you, you fill with our concentrate and you add tap water um, and you, you mix it up at home. So um, little concentrates that come in plastic-free packaging that you mix in a reusable spray bottle to avoid plastic waste and shipping unnecessary water around the world. It's one of those things when you hear it that seems so obvious suddenly, doesn't it? You know, you have these bottles full of water and then chemicals put into it, and then they sell on the shelves. But what a waste of all that energy to transport that water in that product to that shelf. And then, uh, yeah, it's just so obvious when you say it. Well, today we are going to be talking about sustainability. And I know for a lot of businesses, this is a very important subject of course, um, as someone with a four-year-old, it is very personal to me. I want to save my son the, the pain of, of, of what we've probably done to this planet so he has a better life later. I think we all need to take it seriously. Not everybody is. And I'd like to talk about that today, about how can people perhaps integrate sustainability uh, mindset into the things that they do. But before we go there and, and get into that and, and what you've learned about building a sustainable business in a sustainable space. I'd love to understand how this all started. How did you start Neat? What was the, what was the, what was the spark? What made it happen? Yeah, I think um, it's a bit of a combination of two things for me. There's, there's three of us um, who founded the business, myself, um, Melissa, who's more of an investor founder, and Josie, who's my more day-to-day co-founder, the two of us um, run the business on a day-to-day basis. Um, Josie and I actually met working together at eCover and Method, so kind of two of the more um, big eco-friendly cleaning brands um, in the category. Josie was on the commercial team. I was on the kind of product development innovation side of the business. And I guess it was working there that we both became aware that most of what we were building, selling, um, was in most cases about 90% water. Um, And then obviously with that, bulk of of liquid you've got to package it in a certain way that then it shows up so it creates value on shelf and and looks good and 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 commands um a a certain price point so it was really that moment that i guess busted that myth for us of like oh wait a minute so this is this is actually mostly water and then the idea that if you were to take that away you could really rethink and, and create something entirely different um i guess for me personally then My previous job before working at Method and eCover designing that packaging, I worked with Starbucks in Asia where I was developing a lot of their reusable um, uh, drinkware that you can buy in store. So, you know, all the kind of stainless steel, glass um, merchandise that Starbucks have in store. I was designing that. So I guess with the kind of link between these two things where I thought, um, what if we introduced a reuse element to this where you've got a vessel that is no longer disposable, something that you keep? which we were seeing already happening in drinkware, coffee cups, that that behavior was, was a little bit more established. And then the idea of removing the water to create this concentrate and then using tap water, um, which people have at home. Um, so yeah, that's that's really where the spark came from, is this, this knowledge that most cleaning products were 90% water. And that, that if you remove that, you could, you could really do something entirely different with the product execution. 
So you had this spark, you knew there was a market. How, what did you do next? Um, I guess, so the space was already starting to to move. There was, there was a, a few brands. I mean, it was a fairly, it's still a fairly um, busy space, I would say, globally. There's brands in the US doing these things. I guess what really motivated us to do something was we didn't see something on the market, particularly in the UK, which is where we're focused, that really we thought could could solve the problem in a way that was going to be impactful, uh, more in a, in a mass kind of way, that it wouldn't just be a niche um, product that people might think is interesting, but it's never going to make them shift from what they do today to something different. Obviously, our mission is to eliminate um, single-use plastic and plastic waste. Um, that's what we stand for. But in order to bring people on that journey, I think you really have to look at what they need, what they care about, and to make sure that you deliver something that is going to, to not be too much of a compromise. And I think having obviously worked in cleaning products for, for many years, I felt quite clear on what those things were. For example, um, you could have a solution that is tablet-based or powder-based. Um, any of the products that we use like that just felt so... Um, they were so inconvenient if you think about the scenario of a real busy home where you're trying to just get through the day and you run out of cleaning product and now you maybe have to wait an hour or two for the next one to kind of dissolve and then mix up. And even in that case, they tend not to clean as well and the fragrance experience isn't as good. And there's a possibility that the dip tube can get blocked with the product. So we thought if we're gonna do this, we basically have to create something that is kind of as good if not better than the current offering. We thought if we're gonna do sustainability, we don't want it to be a compromise anymore. I think people have come to expect uh, more from brands and from, from products, especially if you look at like general sustainability, even the likes of Tesla, you know, creating just the best case car that happens to be electric, um, rather than the reason to buy it being it's electric. Um, and we wanted something similar with Neat. We wanted it to be a product experience and a brand um, that was more of a lifestyle home care brand or like a homeware brand because we have this, this reusable element that stays with you. It's not just stuff that you throw away. Um, so yeah, we wanted it to be something that would, that would deliver on what, what consumers really need and love. And I think that brand love piece is something that's really important when it comes to helping people make a, a change in their behavior. I think this is really interesting nuance and I hope my audience is picking up on it this kind of idea that you you know that this problem needs solving but instead of just expecting the consumers to just do it because it, it they should you have to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and actually understand for example when you're going to clean your home how much time you don't have when you're doing that and you don't have time to wait for these things to dissolve so you've really put your your feet in the in, in in the shoes of the consumer to understand them and i think a lot of people don't do that enough in business surprisingly yeah i mean a good example is often people will talk about formats for products now we did start with a, a strategy to bring something that would be applicable to mass retail um, our background isn't e-commerce by any means so that's been a learning curve for sure um, however we did build something that we knew could perform in a in a retail environment up against a competitive set that would be built as a supply chain that we could deliver things into the likes of tesco we were now listed with um, so that that was where we started a, a lot of businesses i think these days are are building um, product solutions around the cost to post it so things that fit through like a certain letterbox size so that they can reduce their shipping costs rather than looking at it first and foremost based on like what does the consumer need this thing to do or the user of that product and a good example is cleaning because fundamentally everybody needs it to clean really well the efficacy of the product is key um, and then second is usually the fragrance experience to be honest and that's linked to the efficacy um, and that we started there and that's how we ended up with a, a concentrated liquid format um, it allowed us to deliver on those fundamental consumer needs in, in our category. Um, so, yeah, it is, it is an interesting one. So, so, again, just before we move on to sustainability and how, how you managed to incorporate it as, a, as a, a, I guess, a core culture of the business, how did you fund this business? How did you 
get it going. You mentioned earlier you had a, another co-founder who was an investor. Is, is that was that the next step? You had this product idea. You, you put yourself in the minds of the consumers. You developed product, and then you got an investor on board. How did you get to market, and how did you get it off the ground? Um, we started actually as a as a collective of three. Um, there was myself and Melissa talking about the idea of bringing a solution to the problem. I had I had looked at concepts before in this space, so I was kind of quite clear on what I what I would do um, and how we could how we could build a a product solution. I think we knew that everything else probably we didn't know in terms of <laughs> how we would bring it to market and and build a uh, an actual business that we could we could you know work commercially with um, and that's when we went and spoke to Josie who I'd worked with before and we talked often about kind of starting something um, and creating a, a, a business of our own um, having worked together and worked well together that felt like a, a kind of a fun thing to do um, so so Melissa and I uh, managed to convince Josie to help us out and get involved as a third co-founder uh, Melissa put in some funds initially to the business that got us that got us off the ground and allowed us to build our first kind of product execution to get the website set up to look at just getting the business set up and then having something that we could initially sell which was our, our first range of products it's changed a lot since then actually we still have those products but we've added quite a few to it and we have repackaged them in terms of the format um but yeah that's that's kind of how we got out the door and I know this might be personal, so don't feel you have to answer, but a lot of our audience ask about you know, how to raise money and how to make a business work. And I, and I listening to you, your formula sounds quite unique and interesting. So um, Melissa put some money in. Was that a shareholder loan or did you, there was an equity involved in that? How did you structure that? Because it, it sounds like it works. So I just wonder if there's a learning there for our audience. Yeah, um, it was a, a, a loan to the business. Um, I don't know if there's a problem with me saying that. Um, and that, that's how we decided it was it was best to set it up. I guess the unique part was that you know Josie and I are bringing we're bringing our experience to the to the table, and having both worked in the category, the the hope was that this would allow us to do things quicker and more effectively and smarter because we had experience. And I think the learning, or at least the the hope that I would I would have for other people out there in jobs thinking. If I ever wanted to do something of my own, I think having creative skill sets maybe allowed me to go and do stuff quite easily off the ground. Um, I could literally create designs, 3D renderings. I could work on the packaging. There's a lot of stuff that I could kind of do. Um, but I think for anybody who's in, in, a, in a role, I don't know, I think always keeping your ears to the ground and, and talking to people. Like I got to know Melissa through an old colleague and we literally just started to talk about what we could do and how we could do it. Um, and had obviously the joint passion and, and vision to see this thing brought to life. So yes, I think it's an unconventional way. I think it's really effective. It's been it's been wonderful for us. Um, there's a lot of trust involved, obviously, as there ever is in in starting a business. But I would encourage people to think a bit um, differently about that, depending on what stage you're at. You know, it is for me. I wasn't in a position to to put. Um, tens of thousands of pounds into a business on my own but I knew that I had the the ability to do a lot of the the work and I had the the, the drive to make it happen um, I think I literally did the equivalent of an MBA in those first six months probably <laughs> I still hate using Excel and refuse to but, but that's what it's like starting a business sometimes it is a, a real life MBA isn't it you, you learn yeah, the job and 100%. if you surround yourself with people that can help you. You can learn very quickly, and uh, that's why I always say anyone can actually start a business. You just need to know your skill set, to your point, what you're good at, and bring in what you're not good at, and and get help. And so, I mean, I, I again, I couldn't I couldn't resonate more with what you're saying. I mean, I personally have learnt marketing, and that that's translated into everything I've ever done. And so, you know, you can learn that core thing that you're passionate about. And then eventually you can leverage it to start another business or start a business. If this podcast is inspiring you to start or grow a business, then I recommend you use Taylor Brands. They are our sponsor for this podcast and they help you not only craft a brand, but design merchandise and so much more. In the last year, I've used this site for every single one of my businesses. I couldn't recommend them more. And we've even negotiated a 40% off discount code for you. Just use PEP, P-E-P, when using their website to make your booking.
Now, let's get back to the podcast. You're very humble. You're one of the market leaders in this space. I, I think it's quite incredible what, what you're achieving. And, but you, know, you mentioned their e-commerce and, and uh, distribution. So tell us about that journey. What, you know, people listening want to learn about distribution. You know, what, what, I, I, I think you're selling, my, my guess would be you're selling most of your products for your e-commerce structure. How are you doing it? Tell us. Actually, most of our um, revenue is coming through our wholesale or B2B business. So we're currently listed in, we just went into Tesco uh, before Christmas in 158 stores, which is awesome. Uh, we have secured another uh, nationwide retailer that will be happening in March. But that's, I guess that's still on the down low, um, depending on when this podcast comes out. It could already be. Did we get happened. a scoop just then? It could be a scoop. Um, so so that's, that's great. We're also in Boots. We kicked off on Ocado pretty early on, which has been great for us. Uh, a wonderful platform just to kind of like, they, they try things quicker. It's obviously e-commerce, so you can, you can edit faster. And, and, and it's, there's, there's, it's easier to explain something on Ocado, I always think, because you've got that, that moment of somebody watching a video or something can be, can be built in. But um, yeah, we're in, in Selfridges, we're in Booths, we're in Lakeland. We've just gone into in, in 70 stores there. So, so the retail side of the business is really um, our, our primary channel. Our e-commerce is is definitely important. And I think with COVID, we were kind of forced into that channel in a way that we hadn't planned for. Um, we literally finished our first production run um, April 2020. It feels like longer. That's Yeah, that sounds like not that long ago, but it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, yeah, April 2020, we just finished production. We were actually going to be launching into Selfridges, who were kind of resetting their ocean project to Project Earth. And we were going to be a brand um, as part of that on the ground floor. And it was all very exciting. And obviously, Selfridges kind of shut um, two weeks before that was supposed to go live. So, so we were sitting there with all this stock. And, and <laughs> yeah, and we were like, what am I going to do with this? Um, yeah, and we managed to pivot. It was obviously a tough time for, for the category buyers were in that mode of just like essentially trying to keep toilet roll on the shelves because that's when everybody was just running in and grabbing everything in terms of cleaning products. Um, so it was a bit of a mad time. Buyers were less open to having conversations about new innovative things. They were just too busy um, putting out fires really. And then, so that, that did force us to think about our Shopify, which we, we'd set up a Shopify because we felt like, you know, it's 2020, we should probably have a website that sells the product, right? Um, which, which often isn't the case actually traditionally in FMCG. Many companies just wouldn't have done that in, in the, back in the day, even um, working at eCover Method, they, they didn't have their own direct consumer platforms um, when we were there. Um, so, so yeah, we had, to, we had to start learning that one pretty fast, really probably not successfully for the first 12 months until we managed to find some people who knew what they were doing that could help us and give us really good advice and, um, help us build that platform so it could perform well, which it is now. It's growing um, month on month. Uh, we're seeing uh, really nice um, numbers there and nice uh, percentages that, that kind of give us confidence that it's a channel that we can really make work. I think it's tough when you have that omni-channel approach to figure out, um, I guess, the, the priorities and how you want to make decisions around product execution, pricing, and, and the complexity of your supply chain. So early on, um, obviously, when you're providing product to a retailer, it comes in packs of 12 or six and pallets, um, whereas the, the e-commerce side of the thing is more individual pieces being picked and packed and sent to someone. So we've been trying to build something that will, will allow us to perform on both channels. I think that the website for us is a really great opportunity to community build and, and engage with with our customers in a way that that's difficult through um, a retailer. Um, it's also a way for us to test things and learn and engage. You know, we can send out customer surveys to our mailing list and understand what they really think and feel or why they did buy something and why they didn't buy something. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, it plays a really important role in the kind of ecosystem of, of a brand and also then just how people like to shop um it just some people will shop there but often people will do both you might go to the website sometimes and you might pop into store and pick something up and i think being available in all those places as a sustainable brand trying to solve a problem i think the more 
accessible we are, um, the quicker we're going to solve the problem. Well, there's so much I want to ask around that. I think, you know, maybe conclusion, you know, if, if someone was starting out, do you, do you think that there's a B2C approach or B2B approach? Do both? Do one? What's your feeling if you did it over again? It's a good question. I think it, it does depend on your circumstances because I think, again, maybe it might be easier and quicker to do a purely a D to C play initially, and you can probably prove your case. And if you do need to raise funds, for example, that's probably a really smart way to do it. Um, if you're starting off um, quite lean, um, it's a great way to kind of get product out there, build a customer base, and then kind of prove your case. Um, and then raise off the back of that, I guess. Um, in our context, we, we really knew we're solving the problem of, of, of diluted cleaning products and therefore plastic waste. Most people are still shopping in a supermarket for those products. It's a really, you know, it's quite a commodity category. Um, and we knew if we really want to solve this, we're going to have to s stick close to the source. And for us, that really meant performing in, in a supermarket environment on those shelves. So I, I do think it depends on your context, but I, I think the world we live in these days is going to be omni-channel one way or the other. And I think most e-commerce businesses um, with consumer goods will end up at some point having to think about either going into boots or you're going into, into a bigger retailer like Tesco in order for you to kind of push that, push that brand forward. I think that you're probably going to end up there someday. So thinking about it early on, I think is smart, but that's just maybe because that's what I know how to do better. Yeah, it makes total sense. And uh, just a quick shameless plug, we're actually sponsored by GoDaddy. And I've been amazed these days how easy it is to actually get the e-commerce side of things set up now. I mean, 20 years ago, when I first started working personally in e-commerce, it cost you millions to set up an e-commerce store. And now literally, you know, you know within an hour, you could have the basics up and, and I've just been blown away by, by that. Um, and that's a real advantage now as well, isn't it? as opposed to where you really had no choice uh, when you started a business, probably to go B2B initially. It was a lot harder to do commerce, e-commerce. And there's a lot of drop shipping fulfillment systems too now as well. So you don't even need to hold the stock in your, in your uh, premises. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting opportunity there for people. And I love the community build point you're making there, which I, I agree. You know, having a direct contact with your customers can make a huge difference. Now, look, uh, we're running out of time, but I really want to just pick your brain on sustainability. And a lot of people do want to be a sustainable business. What was your experience uh, getting into this space? I mean, and I know I've seen some businesses, for example, going B Corp on, on it and, and, and approaching it that way. But what's your feeling on, on approaching uh, being a sustainable business? B Corp's amazing, by the way. We've just um, put in our application. So we were scoring high enough to be a B Corp. We're just waiting for that application to come through. So hopefully by March, um, we will be a certified B Corp. Um, so that's awesome. Would encourage anybody to, to do that immediately um and we'd be happy to help we've we've been through the process so if you ever wanted to reach out and give us a shout we'd be more than happy to help people i think um, that would actually be that that would be a great video we should do that and we'll put it in the links below something we can yeah. share with people about that approach and how to do that a lot of people want to know yeah i mean my, my co-founder josie has worked in a number of b corps including ella's kitchen and the baby food brand so she's she's hugely passionate about b corp so right. um, and she did right. most of the work to, to get us certified so i'm not going to take the credit for that not um, easy. It's not an easy process, but if you, yeah, yeah, as you say, absolutely. if you understand it, it helps. Yeah. Um, so uh, on sustainability, I think, you know, for us, sustainability is really built into the core of our business. And I think maybe businesses that have been around for longer are now trying to maybe retrofit things in. Um, so maybe that's a different challenge. Um, and there, there's definitely ways to do that. B Corp is one. And then just your own kind of looking at what you do and understanding the life cycle um, or, or that the... I guess the analysis of your supply chain at least to understand where there might be some quick wins in terms of packaging reduction, carbon reduction. You know, I think the more we can understand about our businesses, um, the more we can make quick um, wins to, to improve things for the planet. For us, it's built into what we do at our core. We know that need exists out of the idea of solving this problem. So, um, we're quite passionate about obviously sustainability being almost at the point where it's it's so obvious and fundamental 
that we don't even talk about it that much because it's it's just something that we do without thinking about. And I think that's today, I would say anybody who's thinking about starting a business, I don't think you have the the luxury of not thinking about this. It's it's fundamental. I know when it comes to even you know getting investors and, and raising funds, they're gonna ask about it. It needs to be in your pitch deck. You need to have thought about it and you need to have a point of view and a bit of a plan, especially when you're starting something new. Because I think previously, you know, it, we could we could pretend we didn't know any better, or you could kind of bluff your way through it. But I think these days everybody's aware of it. It's 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 critical. Um, we know it's it's time sensitive, um, and therefore, if you're in a position where you're thinking about starting a new business, I think you you you've got to build that in as a a fundamental piece. You know, you've got to think about. The commercials, you've got to think about um, your 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 team or your governance and setting up the business, but you've also got to think about the sustainability. It's just, I think it has to be um, as important as any other element in starting a business these days. And maybe I'm just um, a bit extreme on that, but um, I think it's really I, I, important. I, I can concur, by the way, on the investor side. I mean, investing in uh, sustainable businesses used to be a niche used to be seen as, as as something you did as maybe a particular type of investment focus. But but these days, I personally invested in 74 companies. It, it is literally, if it's not in there, people worry whether it's a business of the future or not, if you don't have a, a mindset towards it. I mean, I was even recently looking at a Bitcoin mining business that is literally trying to go green and, and, cre- and create energy, not take energy. So that's the way it's all going. Amazing. And, and um, yeah, exactly. Just and and there's opportunity if you think sustainable. You know, I think the uh, the business is sustainable, and and of course the resources required to make that business work are sustainable. So it literally feels like not just maybe you should, but almost if you don't, I think you'll find life a lot harder. You're missing a trick. I mean, I think you know, it's for me. I knew my, my background is design, so I was you know writing essays on on kind of the circular economy 20 years ago and it was it was always kind of important for designers but there wasn't often the way for me to influence it i'd end up working in places and my job was just to create the thing and that was it and then i didn't have any other um levers to pull in terms of maybe that more the the supply chain or rethinking maybe how we how we sell the thing so for me starting neat gave me the chance to look at it holistically and think you know can we can we bring design solutions to this that's going to bring um, products that are a real solution to your problem. And personally, I feel like businesses, especially small startups, if I look at how long it's taken the government to solve some of these things, I think if we collectively as a group of entrepreneurs put our our heads together and take that responsibility, um, I think we might be able to solve some problems a lot quicker than them. I couldn't agree more. I often say you know, entrepreneurs can solve the world's biggest problems. We don't. We don't need governments to get involved and cause confusion. Yeah. So it's uh, now you're and you're you're leading the charge, Ryan. And thank you for doing what you're doing. I'm personally a big fan of your products, and um, of course, anyone that wants to know more about your business and your products, we'll put the link below along with uh, when we have it ready uh, an introduction about how to get uh, B Corp certified, which I agree as well is is awesome. Totally. Ryan, thank you so much for taking time out to share your knowledge with us today. My pleasure. Thanks a million. Thanks for listening to Pep Talk. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow The Purposeful Project on all our social media channels where we're giving away even more free business secrets and entrepreneurial value. Again, we'd like to thank our sponsor GoDaddy for powering this podcast. From naming a business to buying a domain name to building your website for free, GoDaddy has you covered. For 40% off GoDaddy tools, click the link in the podcast note below and use the code GDXPEPTALK. See you next time, entrepreneurs. And remember, you're not alone.